Testing, 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 testing. Okay, so I want to take a moment to welcome everyone to the San Francisco Java User Group and to Pivotal. Is this a first time at Pivotal for anybody? Welcome, especially to the newcomers. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, restrooms are directly behind this wall. I would recommend the hallway, not trying to go through the wall. It's a little bit less painful. Um, so Pivotal, we have a, a few things that we do on a regular basis. Um, some of you are likely familiar with a lot of our open source offerings. This mic is very hot. Um, so we are well known for Spring. Um, we also do a significant amount of other open source con contributions to, let me go turn this down just a second. Okay, let's try this again. That's a little bit better. Um, we've made a significant number, I would think it's somewhere around three quarters of the lifetime commits to Tomcat were made by Pivots. Um, we also have a product offering that is Pivotal Cloud Foundry, uh, which kind of offers an abstraction layer that sits on top of uh, various clouds, either on-prem or public clouds. Um, and then we have a services organization, which is where I come from, uh, where we will work with engineers for our clients to both develop a product and to teach software development projects and improve agility within teams. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, you can come find me at the back. Um, but without further ado, I don't think anybody came here to listen to me. Um, I'm gonna introduce the illustrative James Weaver, who's gonna talk to us about music and quantum computing. I think, oh. Thank you. Um, actually, um, I, I'm gonna need you in a second, Bob. I wanna get a a selfie with the audience, okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so my name is James Weaver. I think I've met all of you. And I'm a quantum developer advocate with IBM, IBM Quantum. Uh, my slides are actually here. The, if you just go to slides.com slash javafexpert, that's my Twitter handle is javafexpert. And then jamming dash with dash IBM dash quantum then you can, you can see these slides and there are a lot of links in here to demos and things like that. Um, so this is some legal stuff from IBM. It means don't trust anything I say. So, and uh, a little bit about me. Um, I've written several Java uh, books on, mostly on Java, uh, Java EE Enterprise Edition, Java FX and Raspberry Pi. And so I'm a, a lifetime classical developer. And about three years ago, I investigated uh, quantum computing and just fell in love with it. And so I, 
change directions from classical computing to quantum computing. And that's why I'm working for IBM. Uh, so Bob, could you come here? Okay, so the only problem is I've only worked for IBM for seven months. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to joke around with you a little bit. But, um, but so I, I've only worked for my boss for seven months. And my boss has trust issues. So she sends me everywhere to speak. Can you come over here, Cynthia? I want to get you in the picture. This is Cynthia, by the way. Cynthia and several other people here traveled all the way from South America just to hear me speak about quantum. So, so yeah, so that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, so thank you, Juan and Cynthia. Um, I'm, I think they might have been here for some other reason too, but they dropped in and they're and they're seeing this this quantum talk. So I really appreciate it and and I'm honored that you all came actually. Um, so my boss has trust issues. She sends me all over the world to speak, but then she doesn't really believe that I am doing it unless I get a selfie with the audience. And since, since I'm new, she wants me to make sure that everybody's having a good time. And so to prove that you're having a good time, um, I always ask if my audience will do a crazy pose. So can you do a crazy pose for me? I, I pre okay, very good, that's good practice. Okay, so I'm gonna get a picture with, with Bob here. Oh, sir, uh, could you come over into the audience for just a second? And I need everybody to give me a really good crazy pose. Maybe I'll get a bonus on my next check or something like that. So ready, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna tweet this by the way. So, okay, one, two, ready, crazy pose. Okay, very good. Now I'm gonna tweet this, so if, uh, if, if you told somebody you're gonna be somewhere else rather than here, you might start thinking about excuses right now. Oh, very good, very good. Okay, let me, let me tweet this here real quick. There we go. So what we're gonna talk about today is quantum computing, give you an overview of quantum computing. And then we're gonna talk about this relationship between music and quantum computing. And then I'm gonna go into a little bit of music theory and music history with you and discuss this really old style of music from the 1600s called species counterpoint. And then we will compose music probabilistically and we're going to create melodies and harmonies with quantum notes. And we're going to then program a quantum computer with this open source framework from IBM called Qiskit, Q-I-S-K-I-T. And then we'll do some musical, music composition and jamming demos along the way. So where we're at right now is history is actually repeating itself. Back in the 1940s, uh, the ENIAC was developed, uh, Grace Hopper, Admiral Grace Hopper was inventing COBOL and, and compilers and you know, with other people. And there were, were a limited number of bits, limited storage. Bits were on these, these iron rings of core memory. And uh, computers took up whole rooms and software was in its infancy. So we're at that point now, we're kind of like in 1940s right now with quantum computers because quantum computers take up whole rooms or they can. We have a limited number of quantum bits and we're just making stuff up at this point. Everything is brand new. And so quantum computers then make direct use of quantum mechanical phenomena. So we'll go into some of those phenomena, but there are things like entanglement or, or um, interference, things like that, to be able to then have quantum computations. We announced at uh, Consumer Electronics Show what we call the IBM Q System One, and that's our first production quantum computer that will be, uh, that will we we'll use for customers. So they'll be in the cloud and then our customers can then use them in the cloud. 
So why would we want to use a quantum computer? If we think about the space of problems and the space of solution to problems, we have some problems that are feasible on classical computers. And we have some that are only feasible on quantum computers. And there is an intersection to where maybe the same problem might be feasible on both. But there are, are these problems that are feasible on quantum computers that we'll never be able to do classically. And that's because some problems can, on a quantum computer can be solved exponentially faster. For example, the traveling salesman problem. Um, uh, so at least one of the audience uh, members here is in the space of logistics and trying to find uh, paths that are, that, are, um, that are optimized, to optimize for time and fuel. With the traveling salesman problem is, you know, you start in one point and then you try to visit all the cities one time and then come back to the place that you, uh, that you started. The, the solution space to that is, is two to the N power where you've got um, two to the however many cities combinations of places you could visit. So if I had 50 cities, then the solution space, the number of combinations that I need to consider are two to the 50th power, which is uh, 10 with 15 zeros after it. Another big problem is, is uh, drug discovery or you know, just chemistry um, in general, where we want to be able to model quantum particles in chemistry. But the problem is we can only accurately model about 40 or 50 um, uh, quantum particles in an electron orbital, orbital system. The reason for that is if you want to model one quantum particle, it takes two complex numbers. If I want to model two quantum particles, it takes four complex numbers. If I want to model three, it takes eight. It's two to the n. So if I want to model 50 quantum particles, it takes two to the 50 uh, power of complex numbers. And if I, uh, if I wanted to model 300, which is you know, a fairly simple molecule still, then it takes more complex numbers than there are visible atoms in the universe. And so that's why when you get down to a molecule that's, that's maybe 40 or 50, uh, you need two to the 50th complex numbers. You know, our, our biggest supercomputer right now can hold about two to the 50th complex numbers. So, so as soon as we get to where we can have uh, more than 50 qubits, quantum bits in a computer that are reliable, have, have high fidelity, then we can start to do things that we can't do on classical computers. So we can get to that quantum advantage. In, um, in, in 1981, this Dr. Richard Feynman uh, challenged the world to create a quantum computer. And he's a, a, a famous physicist that, that pioneered the area of quantum physics. And he said, nature isn't classical. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, so if you want to be able to model these electrons, then you'd better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And it's not easy building a quantum computer. And so uh, many of you know who Richard Feynman is. Uh, does anybody watch Big Bang Theory? Has anybody seen that show? So there was an episode in which Sheldon played the bongos. And what he was doing is actually uh, just kind of giving honor or homage to Dr. Feynman, because Dr. Feynman used to like to play bongos and congas to relax. So what is quantum computing going to be good for? And what, you know, what is causing some of the excitement about it? Well, back in 1994, uh, Dr. Peter Shore 
uh, did some pioneering. He published a paper on what's called Shor's algorithm. And the idea is that you can factor large numbers to two primes uh, a lot faster using Shor's algorithm. As a matter of fact, exponentially faster. Uh, so Mu over here, I know, I'm uh, raise your hand. I actually used to work for RSA security. If I say anything that's wrong, you, you tell me. Uh, but RSA security is based upon this idea that if you if you take two prime numbers and multiply them, then you're gonna and you come up with a two, three, four, five digit number. It's easy to multiply them, but it's very hard. It can take years to try to figure out what those two prime numbers were to factor that, right? So. Um, so classically, it could take years and years and years. And RSA encryption is is just as safe as it is, uh, just as secure as it uh, is it is to uh, factor those numbers. Um, with Shor's algorithm, we can do that exponentially faster. There's a part of factoring prime numbers which is called period finding, and so. What Dr. Shore's algorithm does is makes period finding exponentially faster. Well, the following year, Dr. Love Grover came up with, uh, he published a paper on Grover's algorithm and Grover search. And so that's able to, to search a space, let's say records, you could think of it as records in a database, or you could think of it as as paths in the traveling salesman problem. It's able to search that space quadratically faster. So if you had a million combinations that you were trying to search, you could do it with a thousand queries to an oracle rather than, you know, than, than hitting it a thousand, a, a million times. And so that's called Grover's algorithm. And he has a quote, he said, programming a quantum computer is particularly interesting since there are multiple things happening at the same time you need to think both like a theoretical physicist and a computer scientist. So there are skills that, that as a classical developer, you can apply to quantum computing. Um, but I know we have some, uh, at least one PhD physicist here. Can you, yeah, yeah, some, some PhD physicists. So I'm gonna tell you some unbelievable things about quantum mechanics, and hopefully they will uh, corroborate um, on them, but the idea is that um, is that we can leverage these quantum mechanical phenomena. So you, in order to do quantum computing, you need to get a little bit of uh, you need to understand a little bit of uh, quantum mechanics. Not not too much, but you do need to understand it because all of the quantum algorithms, the quantum computing algorithms, are have their basis in quantum mechanics. And it, to me, it's very refreshing as a lifelong classical developer that's been developing with ones and zeros all of my life. It's really refreshing to develop a, upon a platform or an infrastructure that's much richer than that. And it's actually uh, a platform that, that uh, is nature itself. So you're actually hacking nature's computer when you're doing uh, quantum uh, computing. So here is a very gross uh, simplification of a quantum algorithm. So you remember the, you know, the two to the 50th power of, uh, co of complex numbers that we need to be able to use when we are modeling 50 quantum particles. So we need two to the 50th power qubits or two to the 300th power qubits, whatever. But those are all those qubits, they're modeled. And then the first part, when you have a quantum algorithm, the first thing you do is that you, you encode the problem into those, those complex numbers, into those quantum bits, or into the basis states, they're called. If I had 50 quantum bits, there would be two to the 50th complex numbers uh, in, in the in the basis, uh, in the 
um, quantum state. So there would be two to the 50th basis states in that quantum state. And so you encode by changing the phase of these different uh, basis states that you're encoding the problem. And then you run an algorithm that then tries to, using interference, just like waves interfere, you know, uh, in a, on a pond, when you, you hit the pond a couple of places and you see the waves interfere, sometimes they will constructively uh, interfere with each other. And sometimes they will destructively interfere with each other, which, which sometimes they, they both come together and make a very high peak. Sometimes they both come together if they're at a particular phase and nothing changes. And so with a quantum algorithm, what you're trying to do in this phase is you are trying to then uh, interfere those states to where the right answer is uh, it comes, it protrudes because it has constructively interfered. So that's just, that's just kind of a gross oversimplification of the process. And so we will get into uh, some details here. So what are some of the near-term quantum computing domains? Um, right now, we are just building quantum computers. And uh, we have a very low number of quantum bits. Uh, some of them that we're working on are uh, that we offer to our partners are 20 quantum bits. And some of the, the ones that you can play with, actually, um, you could go tonight and um, sign up for free and run programs on a real quantum computer. One that we have available is five qubits. One that we have available is 16. And then we are prototyping a 50 qubit machine. But that's a, a relatively no, low number of quantum bits. And they are noisy. So when we try to control the quantum particles in these, in these quantum computers, uh, there can be some noise. There can be, you know, when we try to, to, to control the phase of, of a particular quantum particle, maybe it doesn't get exactly where we wanted it. Or maybe when we are running a quantum algorithm, those quantum particles are noisy, and so it doesn't exactly do exactly what we told it to do. But even though we have a low number of quantum bits and there are some noise, we can still, there are, there are still some algorithms that are very suited to that environment. And the domains, the areas that apply very well are the areas of machine learning, if you think about machine learning for a second, when you are a neural network, when you're using a neural network and you're trying to, you know, you have a picture of a cat or a dog and you have, so each pixel could be a, is a feature of that input. And so you are trying to then take thousands of features and then you're trying to, in a very high dimensional space, trying to find the boundaries between those features so that then you can then classify that as a cat picture as a, or a dog picture. Well, I just told you with quantum computing, we're taking things to very high dimensional spaces. And so we can use those same kinds of ideas only with quantum circuits rather than neural networks. So machine learning is a prime example. Chemistry, that's an obvious one because, and that's the one that Dr. Feynman challenges to do. If you, you have a, a quantum particle in a molecule and you have a quantum particle in the quantum computer and you use one to model the other, the more quantum bits that you can have in your quantum computer, the more particles you can model. And that again is, is one, even though we have a, a low number of qubits and some noise, we can still do a pretty good job of modeling molecules. Optimization, that turns out to be another one, like the traveling salesman problem or some other types of um, networking kinds of optimization. Social networking or marketing are very prime candidates in the short term, in the near term for quantum computing. And then also finance, the idea of taking a portfolio and all of the, all of the factors that have to be considered at the same time, um, we can model that. It with, with quantum computing. But there's one thing that's conspicuously absent from that list, 
and I don't know why, but that's quantum music composition and improvisation. So I am writing that wrong, and I'm going to uh, explore that with you. Now, uh, during this presentation, I would really love it if you had questions. So as you have questions, please do ask them. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so I think I've met everybody here. I think you snuck in, sir. My name is James Weaver. Keith Williams. This is Keith Williams, everybody. Everybody, this is Keith. Yes. Have I met every, I, I've met everybody else, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Chris Maxwell. Chris Maxwell, good to meet you. We met. No, we didn't. Okay. And your name? No. Sir? No. Good to meet you. Okay. Um, so, please ask questions. Any questions at this point? Yes. From the physicist. Oh, no, this is going to be a hard one. <sighs> Hang on. Wait. Oh. The ENIAC. Don't ENIAC. get back to the ENIAC. Okay. One of the issues was with the vacuum tube that the failure rate was such that you could never scale. Is there a, a scaling problem with the okay. number of so, qubits? Right, so the, the question that, that you're, that you're uh, wondering about then, and, uh, and probably have some opinions on, being a, being a physicist, is that, um, is that sure, we're building quantum computers with five qubits, with 20, we're prototyping 50, but is there some kind of theoretical maximum that we can, that we can uh, do with, with, uh, with our, our technologies? By the way, we use um, this technology called transmons in our quantum computers. And, um, and so, so far, uh, we, we're not seeing any issues in scaling up, but that's not to say that, that that we won't with that particular technology that we're using. But, um, uh, but so far, so good as far as the, uh, the ability to, to scale up as far as we know. Yes. So when you say that you're using transmons, are you talking about Yes, right. So when we say, go ahead. So I'll repeat the question. So when we say nature isn't classical, we're saying nature isn't binary. And that's what Dr. Feynman was talking about. Nature isn't, uh, isn't uh, ones and zeros, right? It's quantum, that's right. Yes, very good. Good, thank you for your questions. Why quantum, why did I do a music demo? Why do I want to compose music using quantum computers? Um, well, music and quantum mechanics are both probabilistic. So we, we, you probably know that quantum mechanics is probabilistic. So what most people don't know, and the, the physicists will corroborate on me here, is that actually quantum mechanics is deterministic. The part that you can't see is deterministic. So. Um, the evolution of quantum states happens um, very deterministically. That's all baked into the universe. What's, what's probabilistic is when you try to measure a quantum state, then it collapses. You're not allowed to see the richness of the, of the, the actual quantum state. You're not allowed to see all of the complex numbers that made up that two to the 300th power quantum state, all you can see when you measure it is which one of those 300 basis states that it collapsed to. I'm sorry, which one of the two to the 300th basis states that it collapsed to, right? So we're going to leverage that with, the quantum, with our quantum music is we're going to put it in a state and we're going to control it probabilistically um, for a particular music style. And then when we measure it, we'll let the universe kind of be our, our composer by letting it choose which notes it wants. So, so quantum mechanics is probabilistic. Is it seven o'clock? Yes, it's seven o'clock. So at seven o'clock, Bob says that, that this, uh, this screen turns off 
and then he's gonna have a little process of booting it up. But while he's doing that, I'm gonna talk about why, um, why music composition is probabilistic. So if you think of a particular music style, I don't care what it is, and you, th and you hum a few notes in your head of that particular music style, maybe a particular song, and then stop and then think, okay, what's the next note I'm gonna whistle or that I'm gonna hum? It's that next note is gonna be one of a few, right? And there's some probability that, that the next note out of those few will be this note. And there's some other probability that it'll be this note, et cetera. So if you think of a jazz style, for example, jazz style uses this, this uh, is basis is a five note, what's called a pentatonic scale. Five, you know, pentatonic meaning five. And so a lot of times a jazz musician will riff in, in a five note blues pentatonic scale and we'll, we'll skip around and go up and down and that type of thing. But the probabilities, if you, if you, uh, if you listen to that particular style, uh, you can pretty much guess um, one of the choices of the next note kind of thing. And so musical styles are probabilistic as well. So Leonard Meyer said, once a musical style has become part of the habit responses of composers and practice listeners, it may be regarded as a complex system of probabilities. So probabilities in quantum mechanics, when you measure, probabilities in music. Perfect combination. I don't know why it's not one of the, one of the near-term things. So to inaccurately paraphrase Dr. Feynman, bongo music isn't classical. And if you wanna make a simulation of music, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. So that's my thesis. So the big idea is to ask a quantum computer to compose music. And what better music for a quantum computer to compose than one that was invented in the 16th century? And so that's why I'm bringing back species counterpoint. So I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna play you a little sample of species counterpoint. So you notice it has two voices and the pitches rise and fall in each of the voices, but they are independent in the way that they rise and fall. But they are interdependent when played with each other, they need to sound good together. And so uh, the idea of species counterpoint um, uses both of those qualities. And it was actually uh, pioneered in, in the 1600s, 16th century by Giovanni Palestrina. And, um, and it was codified by Johann Joseph Fuchs. And he codified it in the 1700s, documenting the relationships both melodically, you know, the way that the pitches rise and fall, and harmonically, when two pitches are played together, how they sound. He codified those, he documented those in this book called Gratis Ad Parnassum, which basically means Steps to Mount Parnassus, which was the home of the muses. And so he wrote this, this, this book, I guess, and then that was translated by uh, someone else here. And what it is, it's a novel, it's a story between a mentor and a student. The mentor is trying to teach the student these uh, how to do species counterpoint in five steps, in five levels. Uh, so there's, there's first species, second species, all the way up to fifth species counterpoint. And so I took some of those rules for counterpoint and I, 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 um, I tried to express those as probabilities in this, count, in this quantum music composer app. So the key part of the Quantum Music Composer app that I'm gonna show you is this transition matrix. And it is responsible for holding the 
transition probabilities, both melodically and harmonically. And I'll explain that in a second. At the bottom, you see that, that uh, it's an open source project. I've got it out in GitHub. It's an Apache 2 license. You can go play with it, download it, and do what I'm doing here. Um, so the transition matrix here is, if you're familiar with what a stochastic matrix is, it's nothing more than you have a column of prior states, like the prior states here are the notes, the pitches, C, D, E, and F. And then you've got a row here, the column headings are uh, posterior states like C, D, E, and F. So I might want to then control the probability that if I'm playing a D, what's the probability I want that the next note will be an E? Well, here I'm expressing it as I want a 0.29 probability. And so I looked at the counterpoint uh, rules and I, um, I just took a few of those rules and I expressed them as transition probabilities. So this particular one, a D going to E then sounds like, like this. So it's rising, but then if, if the measurement, once, once this quantum state is in there, if the measurement was different, then maybe a D would go to, uh, there's a 0.5 probability that it would go down to C. And so, yes. Yes. Not, so we're basically, uh, we're looking only at the last node. So we're basically getting a classical Markov chain. Yes, okay, so yes. What I'm modeling here is a first order Markov chain, which says that, which says that um, you take just one state, in this case the pitch, and then you, you model the probabilities that you want for the next state to be here. And it's a first order Markov chain because we're only considering one note. We could do a two or three or four order Markov chain and, and, and try to figure out like, what the last three notes were played and probably do a better job then of, of, um, of modeling a particular style of music. Yes. Okay, so the question is, how do we choose the probability that we want? And so I took Johann Joseph Fuchs's uh, book and, um, and for example, one of the, one of the rules was uh, prefer descending in small steps uh, than ascending, but always, um, but always prefer to do small steps rather than big leaps. And so that's why, for example, for, for C to D or D to C, I made it half probability it would go down to C, but then, the, right, I'm sorry, the up. Right, yes, so the F is going to be um, it's going to be selected less because 0.21. Um, it's uh, the F from, from D to F. You're talking about from D to F. Um, that's a larger step. So that's a, a minor third going up from a D to an F. So the, the smallest step would be from D to E and then D to F. And then like F to C would be descending in a big step. So. Okay. Yep. So now we can express the harmonic characteristics. So if I play this, we have a, uh, a, an F and a D playing at the same time. And notice that that sounds good to the ear. It's consonant what's called consonant. And that's one of the qualities that we want in counterpoint music that's prescribed in counterpoint music, that all harmonic consonances are allowed, et cetera. And here, what I'm trying to do is be deterministic about it. Whenever an F is played, I want a one probability that a D is gonna be played. And that way I can control in this, just these four notes, it turns out that with these four notes, there, there are only a few that sound good together. And so I wanted it to be deterministic. 
So now, after all that, what does quantum have to do with this? Um, and so, in the Quantum Music Composer, we have the pitches. So I'm, gonna, I'm showing eight pitches here in the diatonic scale, the white keys on a piano. And each one is being represented by a quantum pitch. Why do I say quantum pitch? Well, um, the first thing that should give that away to the physicists is that there's this thing called a ket. And a ket, K-E-T, is you have a pipe symbol and then a greater than symbol. And then a lot of times either a Latin or a Greek letter in or some, some constant in there. But that, whenever you see that, you can think of a quantum state. And that, uh, that was invented by Dr. Paul Dirac a number of years ago. And each one of those quantum states represents this vector. Now, in Java terms, it would be this, this one-dimensional array. But it's a vector that has, could have many, many elements in it. And, um, but we can very succinctly represent this vector, which is this vector of many complex numbers, the, the complex numbers I was talking about, that's in a quantum state. So there's a C, a D, et cetera. So we're going to represent the quantum the, the pitches as quantum states. And then we are going to represent the melodic and harmonic uh, transitions as qu uh, with quantum logic gates. So those probabilities that we desire, we're going to encode those into quantum logic gates. So uh, just at the very abstract level, I'm going to put a U here, it just stands for unitary. Uh, all, the, all the quantum logic gates are unitary matrices. So they're, they're, uh, um, they're square matrices in, in terms of linear algebra, just square matrices of numbers, complex numbers. And it, this matrix will turn that C in this particular pitch into this particular pitch. And so we'll, we'll talk about how that's done. So that's what quantum has to do with it. We're going to model everything, both the pitches and the transition matrices into um, quantum concepts so that we can run them in the quantum computer. You with me so far? OK, good. Now we're going to get into a little bit of quantum mechanics. So we're going to represent some quantum states. Now let's just go down to two states one and zero, or in our case, you know, like it, normally you would see a quantum bit here and it would have a zero in it and a quantum bit there and it had a, a one. So it's qubit zero, qubit one. And, but since we're talking about music, I'm going to introduce this as two pitches, just two pitches out of the, out of the eight here, C and D. And so what this is, this is just a two dimensional plane. And there's the x-axis, we'll call it the c-axis. There's the y-axis, we'll call it the d-axis. And the, the, the radius of that circle is 1. So the length of this particular um, dimension here is 1. That dimension is 1. So based upon what I just told you, if this is a, is a two-dimensional vector space, what would the, the coordinates of that C be? It's how many, it's what, what number on the C axis? What number on the, on the D axis? Zero, so it's one zero. So I can represent this quantum state C as a vector, a two dimensional vector, one and zero, which is one on the C axis, one on the, or zero on the d-axis. With me so far? Okay, good. All right, so if you're with me, tell me what, how we represent the d. Zero, one. Very good. All right, so now I've got this other quantum state. So it's not so easy, it's not classical anymore. So it is some combination of c and d. And so in the quantum world, 
That's a real thing, and it's and you can represent it. We can't see it, right? Because as soon as we measure it, it's gonna it's gonna go away into either C or D, right? It collapses into one of those states. But in the quantum world, there is this thing that's a combination of C and D. As a matter of fact, it's a it's a combination of a particular formula. You know, it's it's the root of one third C and it's the root of two thirds D. And so we can represent it in this, on this unit circle. As a matter of fact, all pure quantum states are gonna lie on this unit circle as far as in this two dimensional vector space. And so we can identify it in a particular place by saying, okay, it's root of one third on the C axis and root of the two thirds on the D axis. Um, we would call that, if we were talking about in algebra terms, we would call that simply a linear combination. And we would say that the coefficients are root of one third and root of two thirds. Now physicists, physicists like to have fancy words for everything, right? I'm, I, I, I'm, and so they call it superposition. And so and superpositions have this, this scary notion that, oh, it can be, C and D at the same time, one and zero at the same time. And that's actually, uh, most physicists, it's their least favorite way of describing a quantum particle, right, at the same time. Well, it's, a, it's, it's a much as the same time as, it's really just a combination, you know. I could go two feet this way and four feet that way, and I could say, I'm two feet and four feet at the same time. Well, really, it's just, you know, you've just done combination. And then it has the potential, and it, it, it's this quantum state, but it, it's not decided what it really is, what it's gonna collapse to until you measure it, okay? So we could represent that as root of one third on the C axis and root of two thirds on the D axis. And we could also represent it in vector notation as root of one third and root of two thirds. Questions? Have I lied to him yet? Physicist, PhD physicist, keep me honest. Fact checks time. Okay, all right. Okay. So now in the quantum music composer application, we've got these transition matrices and to manipulate those transition matrices, I'm going to use rotations on that that unit sphere, or unit circle. So remember I said that, quant that pure quantum states can only be somewhere on that circle. And that means that these a quantum state evolution, right? I'm going to evolve a quantum state from one state to the other. That's nothing more than rotations on this circle. So I'm going to then rotate things on the circle. That, that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna put that into the transition matrix. So I'm gonna to go to the application. First of all, start it up. It's, a, it's written in Python and it uses Qiskit, which is our open source framework. And it's called Quantum Toy Piano. Oh, it's already running, I think. And so we'll go ahead and and invoke it here. Right, so I'm gonna say um, the melody matrix, I'm just gonna rotate the C, D axis here until the probability is what I want. Well, I want a 0.33 probability, a third probability that the C will um, go to the C. And then I want a uh, a 0.67, well, that's close enough, I said, there we go, 0.67, two thirds, that a C will go to D. I'm gonna have a, a, a two thirds probability that D will go down to C, et cetera. So that's, I'm just changing that particular, those probabilities. Now, if I click off the show probabilities and I want to see what's underneath, so I wanna see the, um, I wanna see, these 
coefficients here. Now, physicists call these coefficients amplitudes. They call them probability amplitudes, right? So I want to see these amplitudes. So in the application, I'll unclick the show probabilities, and what, it, what, we, what we see then is the amplitudes. And so on this slide, what I'm showing here is that these are the probabilities, right? The one-third and the two-thirds, that's my desired probabilities. And these are the amplitudes. And so root of one-third, root of two-thirds, that's what I'm modeling there. Questions? So we have a question from the stream asking if the superposition of C and D would not just be a C-sharp. That's a very good question. It's a very good question. I get that question about every time, by the way. So, so, so thank you for, for that question. Um, it's not going to be C sharp because as soon as we measure it, it's going to collapse to either C or D. Now, if I wanted to model all 12 notes in the, in the, you know, in the chromatic scale, I could do that. And I could, I could when it collapsed, it would, uh, I could have a state that represents the, the, that one. But now in the quantum world, if you could listen to it, maybe it would sound like a C sharp. I don't know. I'd have to defer to the physicist being a little tongue in cheek there. All right. So how do we compose a melody? Well, we start out with a state, let's say C. We run it through a unitary matrix for, that represents our melodic transitions. And what's in that matrix? Well, what's in that matrix is actually these numbers right here. It's a matrix, it's a two-dimensional matrix, square matrix with, with two uh, dimensions, rows and, and columns, just that's the matrix. And we run it through that matrix and then it's gonna end up in some kind of superposition, some combination of C and D, or you know, maybe, it, maybe it ends up as C or D, it just depends on what's in the matrix. And then we're gonna measure it. That symbol means measurement. So we measure it and then it collapses. And it's gonna collapse with one, pro with one third probability as C and it'll collapse with two thirds pro uh, C. Okay, getting out of myself. And we're gonna run it through another unitary matrix, another you know, quantum gate. And then it's gonna end up in another superposition. We, we measure it. But let's say that it measured as a D with two thirds probability. And then we do the same thing keep going until we compose a song. It's gonna be a very boring song. It just has C's and D's in it, but we'll go ahead and do that anyway. Let's see, are we all set up for that, I think? And um, I'm gonna to go to, that's melody matrices. And then I'm gonna to go to harmon, harmony matrices. I'm not interested in harmony, so I'm gonna click that off. And then we will go to the jam on tab here. And I will, um, I will say, give me a melody. And then it's, 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 I'm actually using a quantum computing simulator. Um, one of the, one of the, the several back ends, the, the, uh, the, the quantum computing devices that we have available are, we have several uh, real quantum computers and then we have some quantum computing simulators and then one that actually runs locally. And so that I, um, uh, so that I can be very deterministic about the timing and about, you know, networks and things like that. I went ahead and used the local simulator. Um, but then it came back with this string and I can paste that string into, into a music uh, scribing software here. Anybody's ever heard of Lily Pond? Uh, where'd it go? Where did Frescobaldi go? Let's see. Okay, here we go. And then I paste that string into here and then there's our melody. And I'll go ahead and play it for you. Could you turn the sound up? I'll play it again. Not that it's super interesting, but I'll go ahead and play it anyway. Okay, questions? Very impressive, right? <laughs> 
it's only a little more impressive than the one note samba. Who of my Latin American friends remembers one note samba? Oh, or, or you don't have to be Latin American, by the way. <laughs> Just from, from South America, friend. Yeah, how's it go? Let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it just got one note in it. Uh, so it was, uh, who was it? Brazil 66. Who was it? Something in the Brazil. Who? Uh, who? Bon Jovi. Oh. Oh, no. I don't. It's that's an, not Antonio. Tom Jobim. That's not who I'm thinking of. You would know better than I, but there's a particular something, somebody in the Brazil 66, and then it became the Brazil 77, and I can't remember the, the name of the, the, the person that, was, that created. They also did the girl from Ipanema. Yeah, Antonio Jobim. Okay, and, yeah, yeah. Jobim. So, so I, have it, I have it on good authority. Okay, so thank you. So now if I wanted to compose a whole song, with harmony and melody, I would just, I would start out with that C, I would do the mel melodic matrices, but whenever I want to play a note at the same time, I would run it through the unitary matrix that, that represents the harmony, harmony trans, uh, transitions that I want. And then whenever two notes aren't being played together, then I just generate a melody, okay? And so what that looks like then, I'll go ahead and do that with Quantum Music Composer. I'll go to melody matrices, and I've, I could do all these rotations down here, but I've got some presets that uh, this one has some of the counterpoint rules encoded in it. And on harmony matrices, I'm going to just do all the consonant intervals, and then I'm gonna go to jam on, and I'll, I'll choose species three, which is one note in one voice with four notes, Sergio Mendez. Sergio Mendez is the person I was thinking of. Sergio Mendez in the Brazil 66. Okay, so, so now we have a string. And, um, and I'll go ahead and paste that into here. And we'll see what the quantum computer came up with. A little more impressive. And then we will, uh, we will play that. I'm gonna play this, Bob. I'm gonna play it again. Ready? So it's doing all that by evolving the quantum states, which is kind of the way that I talked about, and then measuring them and doing it probabilistically. The question I always get, well, what if you did it again? Would it be the same melody? Probably not, right? Because there's so many probabilities. So I'll go ahead and hit species three again. Uh, you've all memorized that melody by now. And, um, and so you'll notice, in fact, you can see it here, that it will be different. Watch it very carefully. See, it's, it's different. And it even, uh, it even sounds different. Okay. So that's the idea. And then each note, remember, they're all represented by quantum pitches. So this particular note, the C, the quantum state is zero, zero in this ket. So we have this classical notion of classical state, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, in this binary progression, but, and those are the basis states, the ones that quantum states will measure to when you measure them. And we put them in kets so that we know that they're quantum states. And so, zero, 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 one, et cetera, whatever the particular pitch is that we start with, we put it into a quantum circuit. The most significant bit, most significant qubit, we put at the bottom, and the least significant we put at the top. So that, is, that uh, zero, one for the D would be zero here, one here. We put those into a quantum circuit. We run them through gates that represent our desired transition matrices, we measure it, and that's how we get the next note. Questions? Okay. So I just wanted to throw in that um, 
that I've been using two-dimensional vector spaces, just a plane here, to represent a, a quantum state. But in the wild, when you see quantum states, a lot of times you'll see them in a block sphere. And um, so here we have our C and our D, or zero and our one. The, the zero is typically up here, the one's down here. And notice we have a third dimension. That third dimension is around the equator. And remember I said that we have complex numbers in the, in the state, in the state vectors and the quantum state vectors, two to the 50th power of complex numbers. Each of those, because they can be either complex, they can have what's a, a phase. So the phase is their position on the complex plane. So a complex number uh, can be modeled on a complex plane. And down here, if we project uh, from the top here, then we can see that there's this disk. And the phase, if it's here, is zero. The phase, if it's here, is pi. A complete rotation is two pi in, in radians. And so the complex plane, over here we have one, over here we have minus one, here we have i, here we have minus i. And so um, complex numbers, you know, have a real component and an imaginary component. So with that imaginary component, you can then model a phase. And so the phase of all of these elements of the, the quantum state, all of the complex numbers then, then are what the secret sauce is for being able to have that constructive and destructive interference for your quantum algorithms. So if you look at this grokking, if you click this grokking, grokking the block sphere link, it's, we've got this visualization that I created to help people um, visualize a quantum state on a block sphere and also visualize different um, quantum gates that are very common in quantum computing. For example, here's an X gate. An X gate is analogous to a not gate in classical computing. So I can hit this X gate and go from this state zero. Where do you think it's gonna go? Hmm, let's see, it goes to one, All right? But if it were some place here, um, then it, what it's going to do is going to do 180 degree rotation around the x-axis, or if, you, if you're more comfortable with radians, it will do a pi rotation in, in radians around the x-axis. So where will it end up? Well, it'll end up somewhere down here, right? So, um, so in this presentation, there's a link to this, this block sphere application that you can play with block spheres, okay? Questions so far? Okay. All right. So now we're going to get in the axioms of quantum mechanics. We're going to get really deep into quantum mechanics. I'm going to teach you three axioms of quantum mechanics, and um, but we're going to do it with cats because because qubits, you know, ones and zeros, and there's already lots of ones and zeros and the matrices and the state vectors and everything. So I like to use cats. So I like to use Schrodinger's grumpy cat. And I'm gonna put the cat in a cat, and that's a grumpy cat. So that's gonna represent uh, our, our state zero, our qubit zero. So I have this cat, and my microscopic cat is sometimes happy and sometimes grumpy, but I've never seen my cat in any, any uh, any state in between those two states. Whenever I observe my cat, my cat is either grumpy or happy. So that's the, um, so we have uh, one principle. Our first axiom is the superposition principle, which says my cat can be in any combination of grumpy and happy. Now this is a review for you, right? So my cat can be fully grumpy, my cat can be fully happy or in some superposition of grumpy and happy. 
So probably no questions at this point, right? So axiom two, unitary evolution. My cat can go from one state to another um, and the gates are modeled as matrices. What's really cool, and it blows my mind, I don't know, you, the physicists are, it, you, it's probably old hat to you by now, but it still blows my mind that you can model nature with simple linear algebra, simple vectors and matrices. So you can model the behavior of quantum mechanics in nature with simple linear algebra. Um, which means you can flip that. And here's the part where I hope you'll corroborate with me. See, baked into nature is this ability, because you can model it with linear algebra, it's baked into nature is the ability to instantly do linear algebra operations with humongous vectors and matrices, right? Because you can model them with those. So if you can set those states up and reliably uh, rotate those states, you know, uh, do the unitary evolution on those states, you can, you can take more, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, take 300 qubits, 300 quantum particles, if you can control them in your computer, and you can cause the universe, because it's baked into the universe, you can cause the universe to do a matrix to vector calculation that involves two to the 300th dimensions, size of a vector, two to the 300th number of complex numbers, and the same thing with the, with, the, with the size of the matrix, instantly, right? So that's the power of quantum computing because you can have nature then do your computing for you because it's baked into the firmware of nature. Am I lying to them? Am, it's kind of unbelievable, right? So anyway, back to cats. Uh, so we have a grumpy cat and uh, we, can, we can hit that grumpy cat. We can take him through a, um, a unitary matrix called an X gate or not gate or a, a bit flip gate and uh, make that cat happy. And so it can be modeled with linear algebra. So here's the Pauli X gate. Pauli was a physicist. The Pauli X gate is, is modeled with a matrix that has 0, 1, 1, 0. And so remember, grumpy cat is 1, 0. And then I multiply it by this matrix, and I get 0, 1. So how, how can you do that quick? Well, there's a trick with when you have a one-hot vector, so a vector that has a one and then zero everywhere else, you take the, the, whatever row the one is in and you pick out that column. So it was in the first column. So we take that column, put it over here, and so we can instantly multiply that. So that particular calculation then is the X gate which then turns the grumpy cat into the happy cat. With me so far? Questions? Okay. So there's this other gate. That was the simplest gate. So there's this other gate, lots of gates, but one's called a Hadamard gate. And a Hadamard is really good at putting cats into equal superpositions. So here I have a grumpy cat running through a Hadamard gate, and he goes into this equal superposition of grumpy, and happy. Notice that the, the, the coefficient, or as physicists say, the probability amplitude is root over one, or the root of one half. And sometimes you see this as one over the square root of two. It's the same number. It's just a different way of expressing that. Sometimes it's easier to think about just putting the whole thing in, into the root symbol. So now we have the cats in equal superposition. Well, what's the linear algebra behind that? Well, the Hadamard gate is root of one half, root of one half, root of one half, minus the root of one half. And then grumpy cat, so we pick out the first column of that matrix, right? The one is in the first row, pick out the first column, and then we get this. So that turn, so, uh, what am I trying to, what am I trying to go here? What am I saying? 
So I multiplied this by the matrix. Oh yeah, so here we have <laughs> uh, equal supervision of grumpy and happy, right? Questions on that? So the third action, you're doing well. You're doing really well. So you've got quantum mechanics nailed now, two out of the three uh, axioms. So now the third one is that the probability is the amplitude squared. So the probability that my cat is going to be measured as grumpy is the square of the probability amplitude, right? So what was the probability amplitude? It was root of one third. Well, so I'm going to ask you, what is the probability if my cat is in that state that when I observe my cat, my cat is going to be grumpy? Somebody tell me. Everybody tell me. One third. There you go. One, prob one third probability of being grumpy, two thirds probability of being happy. All right. So then we could have, so the rest is just kind of, you know, the rest of the, you know, getting a PhD in, in quantum mechanics is just, you know, details like, you know, like this and Hamiltonians and things. But anyway, so the rest is, uh, um, so one of, the, one of the other things that you need to know is that you could have multiple cats. So you might have two cats. And so I would put two cats in a cat, which is the same thing as taking the product of two cats, which is the same thing as doing what's called a tensor product or a Kronecker product of those two states. So to do a Kronecker product, what you do is, is you cross multiply. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to say, okay, one times one equals one. So that's, that one is gonna go up there in the, in the grumpy, grumpy uh, basis state. And then we have zero, zero, zero. So the state, when as a, the state expressed as in cats is this, but the state when I express this as a state vector is, is this, one, zero, zero, zero. So we're just adding more cats, that's all we're doing. And then if I wanted to do, you know, grumpy happy, then we have those two state vectors, we do the tensor products, and now we have that. We have three cats, and that's what it looks like. It's, it's the, that's the idea, right? So if I have three cats, then we're doing tensor products here. Remember, we're multiplying everything by everything. And so I'm going to end up with an eight-dimensional matrix. And there's my binary progression of cats. But the one ended up being where we would expect it, which is grumpy, happy, happy. OK? With me so far? Everybody with me? OK. You're doing very well. Thank very well. So let's put it all together. We, we put the three axioms together. We have, our, we have a couple of cats. We run them through some quantum gates. We end up with some states. And then we measure here with this state with one half probability. I won't beat a dead cat here. I'll just, just go ahead. and. So now that was the axioms of quantum mechanics. Now there's some other fun that you can do with physics. So one of the fun things that you can do is called entanglement. And back in, uh, back in 1935, this, uh, this trio, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, um, published a famous paper on entanglement or trying to explain how entanglement wasn't really a thing or something. And they had a really big problem with it. Einstein called it spooky actions at a distance. And because the idea that you could have two quantum particles that are miles or you know millions of miles apart or whatever and if you measure one then the other one is going to collapse into the same thing as this one how did it do that and so for years and i think i think that einstein died believing that there must be some type of something hidden into these quantum particles that caused them to collapse to the same state rather than some type of quantum field between the two that just magically does that. So he called that spooky actions at a distance. Um, but the idea here then is uh, with cats, coming back to cats, I have these two cats. One's name is Alice, one's name is Bob. And, and I'm gonna model my two cats on a quantum circuit. So a quantum circuit has one wire for each 
quantum bit that you're modeling, or in, in our case, each cat. So Alice is in a cat there. She's on the top wire, Bob's in the bottom wire. And I'm going to take Alice and put her through a Hadamard gate. Now, you remember how Hadamard gates work? They, they put cats into equal superpositions. Now, Alice is in a superpos equal superposition, but Bob hasn't been touched. And then I'm going to go through a C knot gate, a conditional knot gate, which does a bit flip. Remember that X gate? It'll do a bit flip here on one condition, and that is when this wire is one. And so we end up then with a state here, which is called one of the Bell states. So John Bell in 1964 uh, published a paper that had four maximally entangled states. And this is one of them where we have, where we have, I don't think he used cats in his paper, but we've got grumpy cat here. And uh, we have a cat with two grumpy cats, which uh, the probability amplitude is uh, root of one half, and then two happy cats. And so those are the only two possibilities. In this particular quantum states, the only two possibilities when I measure that, it can only collapse to either grumpy, grumpy, or happy, happy. And so that's the Bell state. And so then when I observe one, it's the other one is the same, yes. Right, so we modeled it with a C naught gate, which, which can be modeled as, you know, with matrix with, with, um, uh, with matrices, but what actually, like physically what entangled them. Did my other physicist run away? My physicist is running away. I was gonna ask you a question. I'll ask my other, I'm, I'm glad we have a spare one here. So let's say that, let's, let's just pick, pick your favorite one, photons, ions, I don't care. Pick your favorite quantum particle and tell me um, in layman's terms how you might entangle one. Not to put you on the spot. Um, imagine you take a, uh, mm, I, I, I'm trying to think of a. I'm sorry, think of it, just, just while I'm talking, think of it and I'll, uh, I'll come back to you. I don't want to put you on the spot, I'm really sorry. Oh, no, you, uh, okay, go ahead. you, you take a, a stick, they're labeled and A and B you break it in half and you put it into, and you put each half into an, two envelopes and you mail it to two different people on different sides of the planet. When one of them opens them up, up, up their envelope, they know what the other person has mm -hmm. instantaneously. Yeah, so if I took a, if, if like, like how with a photon or an ion or some, some quantum particle, like I, I know like for example, um, um, if you shot an ion with a laser beam, let's say, you, you could cause um, two, un two ions to become entangled, let's say, or, you know, there's, there's some physical things that you could do to entangle two quantum particles, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so that's, I think that's your question. I just, I'm not, an, I'm not a physicist, so I can't really tell you about the physical. So, but I can talk about cats. So, Alice... Alice goes, uh, takes a spaceship to Mar uh, Venus. Bob takes a spaceship to Mars. And just like you said with the sticks and the envelopes, if we observe Alice, she's happy. 100% probability when we observe Bob, he's going to be happy. But let's say if we observe Bob and Bob was grumpy, then 100% probability that Alice would be grumpy. That's quantum entanglement. Any questions? Spooky stuff. All right, so we have this thing called the IBM Q experience. It's in beta. We just released it about a week ago. And I'll just show you that, this a little bit here. Um, so I go to the experience and um, I go to the, I go to the, the home page here. Then we can either create a circuit or we can create a notebook. So if I say I want to create a circuit, I can go in and I can, um, I can put together this, this same 
bell state that I just showed you in a second ago. So we'll, we'll drag a Hadamard gate down here, and then we will drag a, um, a CNOT gate here, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and measure it, drag a couple measurement uh, apparatuses here. There it is, measurement. Measure that qubit, measure this qubit. And when we measure it, we're gonna put it on a classical wire. Now that classical wire, since it's on the classical wire, our classical computer can read what the measurement was. So that's, that's where the quantum computer then, physically the quantum computer then puts it on that quantum wire where the, 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 the classical computer can get at it. And then we can see things like, um, how is that re represented in code? Well, you know, you're all familiar with like assembly language and classical computing. Well, there is a quantum assembly language. It's a high level assembly language that we can represent these gates and operations as assembly, assembly code at an abstract level. And then that's transpiled to lower and lower levels until the actual instructions are ones that are, are in gates that the actual quantum computer that you're gonna compile it for understands. And so if I, um, if I ran this, well, before I run it, um, I could also look at some visualizations. So remember, um, remember that with a, a bell state here, there's a 50% probability that it's, it's gonna collapse as zero, zero, 50% probability that it'll collapse as one, one. So if I get a zero here, we know this one's gonna be zero, et cetera. So I can see the probabilities in this histogram as I'm building the circuit. But then I can, um, I can save the circuit and I can run it. What do I wanna run it on? Well, I'm gonna run it on, um, I'll run it on a simulator that's on a high performance machine um, in, uh, in Yorktown. And uh, we'll go ahead and run it. And then we can look at the results. So I can see my results. It's, uh, it's already finished here, it's completed. That's the one that started it. Seven, yeah, right, 1953. And so um, we look at it and now we can see the circuit diagram and, um, and the way it was transpiled. And then here's the original circuit diagram. And then here, when we ran it with, uh, I think 1,024 shots, then here are the actual readings that we got and, uh, and probabilities for state zero, zero and state one, one. Okay, so you can play with quantum circuits and you can also play with, um, in here, you can play with uh, notebooks, quantum notebooks. So here I can create a notebook. Or I can load one that's already there. Or I could just sit here and wait for this cursor. So we'll come back to that. Maybe I've got a network issue. We'll come back to that. Um, so there's measurement results. I'm gonna show you a notebook in a second. And if you wanna develop quantum apps, then you could use the Kizkit framework. That's at kizkit.org. And then parts of that framework, there are different layers of that framework. One is called Terra, which is the foundational layer. It has the gates and the circuits and all these registers and things like that that I've talked about. And this is an example. If you wrote using that framework, then this is a, some example of code. You would, in Python, you would, would import some classes and functions, and then you would create a quantum register, a classical register, create a quantum circuit, hang some gates on the circuit, measure them, and then choose a back end you know, that you're gonna run it on, either a simulator or a computer, and then you would print the results. 
And so that code expresses this circuit, and that circuit should be very familiar to you by now. It's, the, it's one of the bell states, and that's the output. So you can easily put together a Python program that, that does some quantum computing. So now I've got five minutes to show you two really quick demos. So one, it's kind of a fun demo, and that is this uh, quantum pong. So um, it, we had a quantum camp in, in the mountains of Vermont just a, couple, a month ago, and my team had just lots of PhD physicists and students and uh, different people that were on teams that were doing hackathon. My team did this quantum pong game. So in 24 hours, um, we created this quantum pong game that, um, that its purpose is to help give you some intuition about quantum states. So I'll go ahead and run this. Coupon. Uh, there we go. And so we take a game controller, and I'm going to go ahead and select the easy level. So over on the left is the classical computer, and it's, it's uh, just programmed to be able to return a ball. But then I have to be able to hurry up and put this thing in some type of quantum state that uh, using gates down here, see, so I have these, I could put an X gate there, I could put a Hadamard gate there, I could put another Hadamard gate, you know, using the controller. And notice that what I have here then is this, this uh, it's not a paddle until, until the ball gets about right there and then it collapses to where the paddle is. But what it is here is just some quantum state. And so it's this quantum state cloud, right, of probabilities, this probability cloud. So then I can, um, I could maybe take this X gate and I could rotate the X gate until we see an equal superposition of the whole cloud, or I could rotate it some more there. Or I could get all classical and I could say, you know, something, I'm just, I want to go ahead and hit something. So I'm going to delete that gate, put an X gate there, delete that gate, put an X gate there. And I'm going to try to figure out where it's going to land. Um, I've got to return one ball to save face here. So um, let's see. Well, look at that. Ah, yeah, see? <laughs> right, but I could have, if I wanted to, if I had gotten closer, I could have changed it to that or whatever. So the, it gives you a kind of a, a, a sense of, of quantum states and, and how manipulating the quantum gates on the circuit then um, changes the state vector, the quantum states, the, the probabilities, the, the, the translucency of, 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 this, of, the, of the paddles or the, the probability cloud there. The translucency is represent, represents the probabilities of each of the basis states. Okay. So anyway, that's one demo. The other demo is I want to kind of finish where I started on the musical thing. And so I'm going to go back to Quantum Music Composer. And um, instead of using the, uh, the, the species, what I'm going to do is go back to Melody Matrices. And um, I'm going to select Counterpoint Musical Style. I'm going to go to Harmony Matrices. And I'm going to go ahead and select Consonant because I want it to sound good. I'm going to go to jam on here, but I'm going to click jam notes. Now with jamming, if two musicians are jamming, what they're doing is one is playing some notes, the other one listens to the notes that, that the one is playing, and then improvises a riff that's going to sound good, maybe picks up where that one left off, and they kind of go back and forth in this call and response kind of style. And so what we'll do is the same thing with the computer. Now, in this program, I've got five different jam notes, six jam modes. I'm going to show you jam mode four, which means I'm going to play four notes. And then the quantum computer, using the probability, you know, the transition matrices, the, is going to jam four notes. And it's going to jam one harmony note. So using the same unitary matrices, um, and um, so we'll see how that works. 
So I'm going to use this instrument that I like to play sometimes. It's called a, it's called a Linstrument. It's a 200 key MIDI controller. And, um, and what I'm going to do then is um, the inspiration was actually from this uh, movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Does anybody remember that movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Oh, very good, huh? So in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, there was this alien spacecraft that was coming to Earth, and it gave everybody warning telepathically that it was coming. And so when it came, they were waiting for him, waiting for the spacecraft. And uh, there's one of the characters that was waiting. There's a guy with a synthesizer that was ready to play some notes and communicate musically to the alien spacecraft. And there's this display back there that displays the notes that the synthesizer is playing as well as the ones that the alien spacecraft played. So I thought that that, that board just looked too similar to pass up to this, right? And here's a shot of, one shot of our quantum computer, IBM quantum computer. I mean, it's just too perfect, right? I mean, so I couldn't pass up the opportunity. So that was the inspiration behind the demo. So um, select jam mode four. Now, does anybody remember that, the, the five note melody from Close Encounters that wants to hum it? What is it? Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Okay, so anyway, that's the, that, I'll just start out the jam with that. So can you like crank it? Okay. Okay, right, so. So that's my demo. Thank you very much for your attention. And, and if you want to stick around for questions, I'm, I'll be here. Uh, so thank you very much. All right.